Tonight on the Book Review Show, Philip Roth, Alan Hollinghurst and The Gruffalo. And at home with the legendary American novelist Philip Roth. Wouldn't people be surprised to think that Philip Roth panics? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, from literature for children to books written very much for adults. Earlier this week, in a glittering ceremony in London, Philip Roth was awarded the International Man Booker Prize. Kirsty met up with him in a rather different setting, his home in rural Connecticut, to discuss life, death, writing and loneliness. Philip Roth, first of all, what is your reaction to winning the International Man Booker? A uh, surprise. Um, I didn't even know I was nominated. <laughs> and then my agent, Andrew Wiley, called me and told me I won. So, of course, you win something, you're happy. <laughs> Saul Bellow described you as irrepressible. What, what do you think he meant by that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know that many people tried to repress me. I met Saul when my energy was rising and his energy was ebbing. Mm -hmm. And I think he found me uh, energetic. I, I, I haven't had to be irrepressible. As I said, I haven't had that many obstacles to overcome. No. I've had some, like, like any writer, but I haven't had that many. You've said that writing has to be larger and darker and deeper than life. Um, how do you summon your strength for that? Life is pretty dark um, and pretty deep. You know, it's all determined by the kind of writer you are from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of um, uh, earnestness with which you approach it at the beginning, um, the kind of seriousness that develops very quickly, um, and you, 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 you must be interested in what you're writing. Uh, why have you got a child's letter set? Yeah, well, uh, it's a fetish. When I'm working, I am inevitably, as any writer does, I get frustrated and can't proceed. Uh, you can panic. What I try to remind myself when that happens is that my goal isn't to write a book. Um, a book is unimportant. My goal is to write a sentence. And in the sentence, my goal is to attach one word to another. I tell myself, like a child, that's all you have to do, is attach one word to another. And within the word, all you have to do is attach one letter to another. So I reduce it to its childish terms, really. So I, I sometimes leaf through it and remember, you just have to perceive one letter at a time. But wouldn't people be surprised to think that Philip Roth panics? In his <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, surely. <laughs> well, you know, the panic is overstating it. Um, I don't run around screaming, no. but I, I become frustrated very often in writing. Um, when you can't proceed, when you don't know what, what, to, write, what to write next. And uh, so I have this strategy to comfort me. Mm -hmm. you know? One of the criticisms that has been raised uh, by Jews and non-Jews is, you know, I remember one headline, why does Philip Roth hate the Jews? Mm -hmm. but do you think there's a kind of <laughs> element in American society that doesn't think that it's actually it's actually right to either satirize or, you know, build on tropes among the Jews, even mm -hmm. now? Well, I don't think that uh, Jewish readers have a hard time with me any longer. The generation that did have either died uh, or shut up um, or think it's a hopeless cause. They might as well, they're not, they're not going to stop me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I began, I ran into a lot of trouble. Uh, in um, 1958, I think it was, before Goodbye Columbus, I published my first short story in The New Yorker. It was called Defender of the Faith. Um, this story um, caused a, a sensation among New Yorker readers. It also prompted s uh, sermons from rabbis calling me an anti-Semite and a self-hating Jew. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, was, it was strong. I was 25. It was the first, it, I just was out of the gate, you know, and this came flying at me. Um, but it didn't hold you back, did it? No, it seemed to have encouraged the opposite. <laughs> what, did your, what did your mother and father make of that, though, at the time? Well, they, 
And they never understood the charges against mm -hmm. me, but they were troubled by them. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember after Portnoy's complaint that where there was a renewed attack, for good reason, I suppose. Um, I was with my mother one day in their apartment, and she suddenly turned to me, and she was very sweet uh, and conventional. And she said, <laughs> uh, Philip, are you anti-Semitic? I said, Ma, what do you think? What do you think? And well, then why do they say it? I said, well, people say it. Um, so they're, they're, they were tremendously proud of me. Even if I was an anti-Semite, they would have been proud of me. Because you're the boy. I would have been the best anti-Semite. It says that you were unflinching about particularly the Jews, but you're also quite hard on yourself sometimes. Am I? Yeah. I should take it easy? Yeah, really easy. <laughs> um, I don't know about that. I, I, I exploit in my background, in my history, uh, what's exploitable and, yeah. and, and go on. So um, I try to... What's the phrase? Cast a cold eye mm -hmm. on everything. Mm -hmm. You're very much the senior figure in a generation of writers, many of whom were very close to you. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel their absence? Yes. The writers, I suppose, I was closest to as a friend uh, were Sol Bellow, who was about 18 years older than I was and who has been dead now about eight years, I guess. Um, uh, Bill Styron, who lived near me here in Connecticut, who was Bill about five years older than I am, who went through a hell of an ending in his life. You said, what was it you said last night? They were all pissed now, they're all dead. They were all pissed now, they're all dead. Well, well, Bill, Bill, Bill could drink, uh, and, but he's of a gener generation of drinkers, of writer drinkers. Uh, these are the fellows who were in World War II, and uh, there are quite a few of them who were very heavy drinkers, and Bill was one. And would that be the same for Hemingway as well then? Well, Hemingway, Hemingway was the model, yes, about how to be uh, a writer and not be a sissy, you know, and how to be a writer and, uh, and be a man uh, in, 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 in their uh, eyes. You were criticized for, as it were, the kind of sexual activity in Portnoy's complaint, and then most recently even criticized for sexual activity in The Humbling. Mm -hmm. um, is there something, do you think, Mm -hmm. of Americans, that they don't like the idea that, well, actually, we're all living longer. Mm -hmm. So chances are sex is going to figure in people's lives for longer, but they mm -hmm. just don't want to hear about it. It's an easy handle by which to pick up, pick up a book. Um, but um, in Portnoy's complaint, largely it was the issue. Uh, there weren't graphic descriptions of sexual activity. There was someone who was, not unlike Congressman Weiner, obsessed by sex. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, in the humbling, not much, nothing much to speak of. It isn't a book about sex. No, I, I, I thought it was a book more about, I thought you, there was a bit of a rage about old age and infirmity in that mm -hmm. book. Well, it's about a man uh, in, in the decline. Um, I, think it, I think he's in his 60s. Um, and it's about man losing things. It's about losing things. Um, and what the effect on him is, the primary thing he loses He's an actor, and she's the ability to act. He can't act anymore. First line of the book is, he lost his magic. Um, and then he has an affair, uh, an odd affair in a way, but uh, passionate, and uh, he loses this young woman. And uh, he can't take all these losses, mm -hmm. and so he kills himself. And no rage, just, uh, just taking a look at it. Mm -hmm. You've written that when you're a writer that you're someone else. Mm -hmm. You said, you know, I'm no longer a son, a brother, a husband, an uncle. I can only be a writer. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you mean? You remove yourself from I everything think, around you. I think that, um, that one's um, ethical restraints, um, one's um, customary caution uh, has to dr dr drop away so that you can freely tell the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're being a good son while you're writing, um, it's, be, it's going to be a book by a good son. A book of, about a good son is interesting, but a book by a good son is slanted. Uh, so um, I, uh, I, love that, I love that aspect of it, uh, which is the freedom. 
your former wife, uh, Claire Bloom, said that since we have been separated, he's published a book a year. You, he can't, you can't write at that rate if you have a life. He has a life he wants, but it's not a life. You ha I, I come here and I think, I expect to find you sort of in splendid isolation. I, I, it doesn't seem like that. Well, there you go. And do you have any regrets about things you might have done or not done? I mean, writing. Writing or family. You know, you are clearly such a family man when you write mm -hmm. about your own family mm -hmm. as well, with a huge amount of tenderness. Mm -hmm. And do you regret not having mm -hmm. a family of your own? I don't seem to regret that. Uh, it's a fact of my biography. Um, no, I, I have some regrets, um, but uh, it wouldn't have been a life without regrets. I, I used to have a friend who's dead now, an uh, American writer, her name is Josie Herbst. I remember Josie saying to me when I first met her, it was one of the reasons I liked her so much, uh, I was complaining about a huge mistake I made in my life around that time. What was that? Oh, I, I married somebody. <laughs> That's uh, just a mistake, <laughs> something happens. Yes. And Josie said to me, uh, if it weren't for my mistakes, I'd still be back in Sioux City, Iowa. Mm. And I thought, that is true. So your mistakes propel you forward. You are not alone among writers, but certainly fewer writers in their 70s seem to be still at the height of their powers. And it seems that you are actually, you, you, you have more in you mm -hmm. now and in the last few years. And your writing is very strong. Uh, I really don't notice any difference in um, the way I approach a new book. Um, and uh, nor have I noticed any slowing up or down. Um, my last books have been short. The last four have been short. Whether a long novel is in the offing, I don't, I don't know. Does writing about modern America interest you, the state of America at the moment? No. Um, no, I, I seem to be about 20 to 40 years behind. You know? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'll have to live to be 110 to write about 9-11. Sure. <laughs> Which, of course, you may well do. Well, you think so. Well, you come here when I'm <laughs> 110. 110. Uh, do you ever get lonely here? Sometimes. But is that something you just have to thaw? These... It does, it's not that bad. Um, sometimes I get lonely, uh, and then I think, but I have no friction. And that beats the loneliness. Can you not deal with friction? Not anymore. You don't fight. I don't, don't want it anymore. I don't want it. It's a great... But you're assuming that if, you, if somebody else was here there would be friction. Yeah. There certainly has been in the past. I can understand how people coming here, it was very much your place, isn't it? Uh -huh. That it would be difficult for somebody to parachute in. Well, you know, it's pleasant. No, not really. Well, a solitude could be wonderful, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't mind being alone. Um, sometimes one gets lonely, um, but that happens anywhere. Mm -hmm. It isn't attached to the place particularly. But you've been here for so long now, you couldn't imagine presumably being, will you be taken out in a box? Will they be taken out here in a box? Um, that may well happen, mm -hmm. yeah. You would stay here forever though? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Philip Roth, in 2011, has embarked on a new book. Mm. And when will we see it? I don't know. I feel no compulsion to, um, to produce uh, a book, you know. Um, I, I, I enjoy, sometimes, the work, but finishing it, all that finishing it means is I have to start yet again, you know. And that's hell. So what, you're trying to cheat yourself? That's right, yeah. <laughs> you're trying to make this one last for a very, very long time. Absolutely. But what if you do live another 20 years? I'll be in trouble. Philip Roth, thank you very much. <laughs>